to feed chaos, to feed their drama in their life. And when there's not enough drama in their own life, guess what? They watch TV, they watch soap operas, they watch the news, and they create more drama. People or society, I would say, are addicted to drama and to chaos. We seek it as a form of stimulation. And if we're not pumped up inside, if we're not revved up inside, then there's something wrong. I often have clients who, after connecting spiritually, feel more peaceful. They report that, you know, I find my life is more boring now. There's less going on. When actually, they've actually achieved a level of quietness within, stillness within their mind. So it's kind of interesting to see how the mind is used in such powerful ways to destroy, to create suffering. I've also been lucky enough to witness clients healing from cancer with their thoughts and their intention. So the mind is a powerful thing. We try to create suffering as a society. We're attracted to that. But let's see what we can do with meditation. Now meditation is about being quiet with them, but also allowing everything around us to go on. It's not about quieting the environment around us, it's about bringing ourselves into stillness, into quietness. Now, the term, the peaceful warrior, means being quiet inside amidst chaos around. And I want to share with you a little story about the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of Tibet. When Tibet was invaded by China in the 50s, there was a lot of pillaging going on, there was a lot of destruction, as you can imagine. The Chinese were overtaking the land, overtaking the people, causing a lot of pain and hardship to the Tibetans. The Western journalists invited the Dalai Lama and asked him, how do you manage to stay so calm throughout all this pain and suffering? Your country, you're losing your country, you're losing your people, you're losing your cattle, your resources, your land, everything that you've built on for years, you're just losing to these people. And the Dalai Lama said, it's true that the Chinese are taking the land, they're taking the resources, they're taking everything around. They can even take a shirt off my back. But the one thing they'll never be able to take, and truly the only thing that we possess, is our ability to feel peace with them. That was a story message, and I remember hearing about the story and feeling, wow, I hopefully one day will be able to aspire to that. To be able to stay within a sense of peace and they saw this chaos around us. Well, I believe that the gentleman that we're about to meet tonight it, it exemplifies this. This is a man who is truly a warrior, who's actually gone to war. He's been um, positioned in Iraq for over nine months, recently came back. He is the first U.S. chaplain, the first U.S. Buddhist chaplain in the U.S. Army. This is pretty historic, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of bringing a man of peace into a place of war and sharing a message of peace to soldiers. Think about soldiers and what they have to go through. They're conditioned by the military to execute, to follow orders, to do what they're told. Yet inside of them, they may have grown up with values of quietness, of peace, of serenity. They may have grown up with values of goodness, love, how do they reconciliate the two? Well, through meditation, and through the power of thought, the power of quietness and stillness, I believe that Chaplain Dyer, that we're about to meet, is able to communicate that message of peace to them. And he inspires soldiers to find that quietness within, to find that clarity of meaning, to be able to make the right decisions when they're in battle when they're faced with situations that are very delicate and, and tricky. Remember, these soldiers are carrying guns that can affect and destroy lives in an instant. They have to have the ability to make very clear decisions in an instant. So if they're in a place of quietness within, hopefully they can make that right decision. So with no further ado, I wish to introduce to you Chaplain Thomas Knight.
the Buddhist chaplain hosts a meditation workshop. It is taught others how to open their minds and focus on the now. Participants learn the basics of posture, positioning, and techniques. 278th Armored Cavalry Regiment Chaplain First Lieutenant Thomas Dyer shares one of the reasons meditation is a great tool to learn. It is better to be at peace than not to be at peace. It is better to be clear in the mind than to be confused. It is better to be happy than sad. It is better to be disciplined and to sit and give your body time to heal than to stay on this wheel of grasping and running. So with that, Buddhism can say to the whole world, start with meditation. The participants learn three different types of meditation, sitting, walking, and tea. We use the statue for inspiration and aspiration in meditation. The incense is a tool that impacts our smelling consciousness. It helps us stay awake and remain fresh in meditation. And then we have bells that will inspire our inner consciousness. The vibration and the wonderful sound of a, a bell begins to clear our minds. Because throughout the day we have worries, concerns, hopes, aspirations, conflicts, past failures, future hopes, all moving in us, in our whole mind system. But when we sit and meditate, we begin to calm all of that. Meditation can be used for health, stress, or spiritual purposes. In Camp Taji, I'm Army Sergeant Audrey Hendricks. So I think I should begin with telling you an experience I had about a year and a half ago where I had the opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama, you see. Um, my teacher is um, Tibetan, he's the highest kind of office holder in the area, and he gave me permission to go into the military as a Buddhist chaplain. And this has never happened before. So he calls the uh, Dalai Lama's office and said, I'm going to put a Buddhist and a Buddhist chaplain in the United States Army. So we really didn't know how this was going to go. Is this going to be okay? Is this uh, kind of thumbs up, thumbs down type thing? Um, is it Buddhist to be in the military? You see? Is it right livelihood? You know, all these questions begin to uh, circle around the issue. But as uh, as karma would have it, or or fate, or providence, or what have you, the Dalai Lama was coming to Memphis. You see, so um, I was invited to give the invocation uh, to a, a, an award he was going to receive, the Freedom Award. So, in Tibetan fashion, we, uh, we received uh, the Dalai Lama. So, uh, at the Peabody Hotel, it's a very wonderful and beautiful hotel, we have these uh, traditional Tibetans who make the traditional offering, and we have my teacher and another of my teacher in line, and then I'm next in line, and we have about two other people. So, this uh, limousine pulls up, and you, you know, you, you can hear the Dalai Lama come out and he laughs and his voice just vibrates through your chest. He's such a, a powerful human being. He comes in and receives the, the offering. And, uh, so we we're kind of like this in a traditional Tibetan manner. And he comes up and my teacher said, here is the army chaplain I told you about. So the Dalai Lama looks like, you know, you know his face. Like, Ooh, you know. Uh, and I'm bowed like this, and he just grabs my hand. It was, uh, it was this hand here. Just a vigorous human being. Grabs me and pulls me real close, and he sticks his face right here in my face. And I can still remember his eyeglasses on my face. And I'm like looking this, like this, into the Dalai Lama is looking into my eyes. 
And we stayed this way for several seconds. It seemed like you know, a whole eternity. And then he goes, <clears throat> and he goes and walks away. And of course I bow and I'm just breaking out in spontaneous laughter. This incredible moment. And then he goes on to his hotel room. And I notice my hand was just tingling. It was just incredible the amount of energy that was coming off my hand. So I told some of uh, the other members of our sangha or Buddhist group that my hand is tingling. They were like, oh, let me touch it. Let me touch it. I thought for a minute, no, I'll keep this for myself. And say, no. So all my, my friends, they, they, they feel this. It was uh, really fabulous. So my teacher tells me later that uh, the Dalai Lama was not interested in kind of what training I'd been through, the fact that I'm Anglo, southern portion of the United States, and, you know, kind of come out of the watermelon patch, and, and here I am, a, a Buddhist uh, chaplain. But what he did, he looked into my eyes, and he wanted to see where my mind was. You see, is, um, is one's mind present up here? You know, where the eyes, the window of the mind. Is your mind looking closely at the window? Or is your mind kind of back? If it's back, it's kind of, kind of foggy and movement and, and kind of, this is the arena of manipulation and coercion. Up front is the position of honesty and sincerity. So what the Dalai Lama wanted to know is, are you sincere? Do you really want to help? So this issue of right livelihood, should you go, should you not go, didn't matter. What mattered are, do you really care? And are you really sincere? And I got uh, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so um, later I began to realize that the Dalai Lama gave me a gift. He transmitted something to me. And what he transmitted to me was confidence. Here I Look at me, you know, Tennessee boy, kind of yeehaw, country boy, I can't survive type thing, you know? And here I am. So I went to Iraq with confidence. Proceed with confidence. Lean into it. Go for it. Do this, you see. So I tell you this story with this kind of confidence, you see. When I came into this world, I came into this world, I can remember a small child being aware of something wonderful and divine, being aware of, say, God, you see. And also I had this kind of strand of, of anger that was in me. Many people come into this world with, it can go either way, you see. We have... Uh, in some ways, we have many choices. In some ways, we can take our life one way, or we can take our life another way, you see. So I went through my childhood kind of moving back and forth. Down in the South, it's kind of a gun culture and a fascination with the military. And, and then there is this side of, of wanting to know God, or wanting to know life deeply, you see. So I made a decision around 18 that I would be a military man. So I was kind of leaning toward this more aggressive side. I thought I wanted to be something like special forces and be a man's man and, and all that kind of thing. So I went to the Marine Corps boot camp. And then I went from Marine Corps boot camp to infantry training school. And I had planned to go to active duty, but I didn't because I was waiting for a friend to come out of high school. We would go together, you see. So I was really um, buying into it, you know. And, you know, the Marine Corps is the pride of the United States Army. I'm very proud of that. Or, excuse me, the United States uh, military. I'm very proud of uh, kind of making it through Marine Corps boot camp and infantry training school. But for me, individually, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else, just Thomas. That training and the anger are kind of fused together. 